Yeah, fun. Fun is a relative term. Okay, we're going live in three, two, one. Good afternoon and welcome to another Grace Investments live stream. I'm back. Yay. I'm still here. <laughs> Con didn't leave. Con definitely uh, held the fort very well, I would say, last week. I managed to watch a bit of your stream. You did all right. Yeah, absolutely. I'd rather not to do it ever again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, there may be a time when you might have to step in. <laughs> That's true. Now, well, now I have a lot more experience, I can tell you that. <laughs> That's right. Thank you to everybody who's been very busy commenting for the last sort of half an hour or so. Um, we are going to be talking about the Nikon F5 today. We did a live stream. We were going to go forwards like F, F2, F3, F4, etc. And then we realized that we'd already done an F6 live stream. So we decided to go backwards and go F6, F5. At some point, we'll do an F4 one. Um, but no promises for any time soon. The F5 that we have here in front of us is actually one of the 50th anniversary models. Ooh. Fancy. It is fancy. Only difference is the cosmetics and the fact that it was released for the 50th anniversary of the Nikon Model 1 when that first came yeah, out. Yeah, it was 1998 it was released. and This yeah. was 1996. Exactly. Oh, this camera. 1998. Yes, yes, it was 1998. And it was 50th anniversary, so it was 1948 That's when right. the first Nikon F was ever released. We can do maths. It's great. Anyway, we actually have this one, which is a very lightly used one and an actual collector's edition in its presentation box downstairs, uh, which Fatini has very kindly put in the description box. So if you want to have a closer look at those, you can. But we're going to talk about the F5 in general today. Now, the co the uh, giveaway. Yes, thank you. I was going to be like, coffee. <laughs> Let's talk about coffee. <laughs> the coffee fund is open, as always. Super chat is down the bottom there. PayPal link is in the description box if you would like to do that. And please do give us a like and uh, subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Giveaway. So we have this wonderful Nikon. It's actually a, I believe, oh, it doesn't say who the notebook's made by actually. But anyway, so we have this beautiful Nikon matte gray notebook uh, and a Nikon pen. We're going to do one giveaway for the comments uh, on the stream today live. And then the other one is going to be for the comments on last week's stream because we get so many people who say, oh, I couldn't watch it live, but I'd like to win. So we've decided to be extra generous. So if you would like to win, some of you have already uh, taken the hint, then you can say, I would like to win and we'll draw your name at the end of the show. Uh, we're going to do the other one at the end of the show as well, right? Yeah, just to keep Both things simple. Together. Yes. All right, good. Am I missing anything? I feel like I'm out of practice. <laughs> I missed a week and I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> Getting old, Becky. I know, it's scary. Um, yeah, it's fun. We'll just, we'll just carry on. So the Nikon F5 came out in 1996. Yeah, if you want me to take over, it's fine. I can do that. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know about this camera. Um, grey card notebook, Peter says. Yeah, it's kind of like a grey card notebook. Exactly. Carry it around in your camera bag. Well, it came out in October 1996, right? Yeah. But in July 1996, there were Olympics at Atlanta. Mm. And the camera was announced just before that. And very limited amount of those cameras were given to press photographers at the event. Which is kind of similar to what they've done with the Z9. Can you see the parallels? Absolutely. So being an Olympics year is quite fortuitous. But... Nikon have kept that same pattern for the last 30 years. Absolutely. Obviously. The Possibly rest longer. of the stream is on Z9. <laughs> that was so, now that we've talked about the F5. No, yeah. it's, um, it's interesting that they gave these sort of, what I'd say, l final prototypes, they called them, to the, the press photographers at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So the, then the final production model came out in October. Do you think this gives us a little glimpse of what might be to come for the Z9? Yeah, I can tell you that Z9 will have a built-in grip, <laughs> just like F5. Yeah. It will have dials, the front and back. Yeah. It will and have the dials here as well, which F5 <laughs> apparently doesn't have. It's true. And the second charge for button. There you go. So basically the Z9 is the modern day equivalent of the F5. It's kind of funny, actually. Um, I have to say a very big thank you to Ian and Peter for your contributions to the Coffee Fund already. Kicked thank us you off. Much. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the 
there are interesting parallels and Nikon have kind of kept that tradition of handing a body that they think should be for professionals over to pros before they release it to the general populace, mm -hmm. I would say. Now, um, there's a few people who say, oh, who's been watching the Olympics? Great Britain. Team GB have done very well, I must say. Team GB. Uh, well done to them. But the interesting thing that I read was that later on, so the F F5 was the last pro um, film body that they gave to press photographers at the Olympics. Okay, so F6 haven't no. been given to anyone. Okay. No, okay. and then they did the D1 mm -hmm. um, at the, what was it, 2000, where was the 2000 Olympics? Well, it was 1996 and then, yeah, year 2000. I've forgotten where they were, but anyway. Somewhere <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Thank you. I could Google it really quickly. But anyway, so in the year 2000, they gave the D1 to pro photographers and apparently it was about a 50-50 split between people using digital cameras, maybe not quite as much 50-50, but there were, were far more photographers using digital mm -hmm. than you would expect mm -hmm. at such an early Olympics. And then by 2004, when it was the Athens mm -hmm. uh, Olympics, most, almost all of the photographers were using digital by that time. Interesting. And because the one kit, so you said year 2000, the mm. one was, it came out. So they had this camera out. And they still had it in 2004. Yeah. That's where it was discontinued and the yeah. 6 was introduced. It's true, exactly. So it held on through three Olympics games, basically. But I don't know how many photographers were using it at the Athens Olympics. That's true. Um, but it's interesting to see how in what would be maybe a relatively short period of time, you would think a four-year span, mm -hmm. or in this case, it was like four to eight-year span, the face of photography and the way that people shot at those pro completely events changed, completely it? changed. But it's interesting one that you mentioned, it was pretty much in the year 2000 half and half because digital wasn't really a proven technology. No, it's true. And we actually, um, some of you might have seen our six questions with Moose, Moose Peterson. Um, I put those questions to him and he recorded his uh, answers for us, which was great. And we're going to try and continue that. Um, and he was one of the earlier adopters for digital for wildlife photography and aviation. Mm -hmm. He was very much kind of an unusual photographer in that he committed fully to it. And there were so many people on the fence when the D1 came out. They weren't quite sure. They were like, oh, it's just a fad. <laughs> it's a bit like mirrorless. Well, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, I think people who would go through a lot of film at the time, so sports, again, air photographers, you know, so yeah. you probably would shoot a lot of rolls of film just per event. So switching to digital was a godsend because you could just get, let's say, one or two memory cards. Yeah. And while they were quite expensive at the time, it still probably would be at the end cheaper and the workflow would be a lot quicker as well. Yeah, exactly. And now, I mean, we're spoiled practically by the technology that we have for that kind of thing. Um, so... There you go. Oh, Sydney was 2000. A couple mm. of people were saying thank you. Australia. Yeah, it went out of my, I went out of my head. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was very much aimed at professionals, although there were a lot of, I would say, prosumers mm -hmm. that picked this camera up. Um, it, the main downside was how heavy it was, I think. Yes. I mean, this is, what, 1.2? Two kilos yeah. or 2.2 LBS, whatever that Pounds. Means. Pounds. <laughs> um, the, the I don't speak that language. Don't speak the imperial system. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, and is that with or without batteries? Because I think with batteries is actually 30. No, no, it's, this is without batteries. Yeah, because yeah. with it's about 1380, I think. That's right. So one point, almost 1 1.4 kilos. It's definitely, you can definitely do some damage with that. It depends a little bit on which batteries you use. Eight AA batteries. Yeah. Um, w when we come to the F4, we'll talk about the, the weight and the various battery configurations of those. But eight batteries in comparison to the later F6, which takes two little CR123s. That's true. Tiny. And also obviously shaves off the grip. It, it was a beast. You'd mm. know if you were carrying it around. Well, fm 3 a that was around at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. They could take two little ones. Which ones are those? LR44s. That's right. Yeah. But you don't get half of the things that you get with the F5. No. And I guess the main thing for professional use, you wouldn't get autofocus. No. Someone said that autofocus probably was the major thing that happened in photography, for like for professional photography. Yeah. 
It was the know. biggest kind of game changer. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. So according to the Nikon History website, it said that when it was released, it was 325,000 yen. But you worked out, I think, how much it was in dollars and stuff. And let me tell you. Yeah. 3,000 United States dollars. Right. And uh, 2,500 uh, great British pounds. Wow. That was back when we actually got things at a different price to the US market. <laughs> yeah. It probably would be equivalent of 10,000 pounds in nowadays money, but you never know. <laughs> yes. I don't know. But but um, yeah, it was much more expensive. Our um, 50th anniversary editions, actually, of them, th only 3,000 were made, 2,000, I think, for the Japanese market and mm -hmm. then another 1,000 for the rest of the world market. But they are selling for, just, for under 2,000 pounds for the 50th anniversary model. And I think, I can't remember exactly how much it was. Was it 400 thousand yen something like that yeah we something around that four three hundred and eighty mm -hmm. thousand yen when that came out so it was a little bit more expensive and it had come out two years later but the differences were purely cosmetic nothing else um it was released eight years yes eight years after the f4 so there was a kind of eight year life cycle on those yes. film bodies uh, F4 came out in 1988. This one came out in 1996. Mm -hmm. And then the lastly, the, the F6 in 2004. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing that you'll notice about F5 body is the actually design language that they use on this camera. Yeah. So designed by Italian uh, designer, mm. first of all. Um, I've got the name. I can't pronounce it. Could you pronounce that name? <laughs> What's the name? All right. Let me Find tell you. Find it for me and I can pronounce it. Giorgio. Giorgio, okay, good. Giorgio. <laughs> Va bene. Uh, Giorgetto Giugiaro? Giugiaro? Giugiaro. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing, I can't speak Italian. Okay. <laughs> I can do the accent, but I can't speak Italian. So, <laughs> hey, um, so designed by him, obviously, first of all, you'll see two wheels, the front command dial and back command dial, or main command and sub command dials, as people call it. Yeah. So you'll see this. You'll see, obviously, the design that effectively... It's still being used on cameras like D6 and mm, D50. Yes, yeah, true. Um, the weather ceilings are also much better compared to a full body. Mm. So that's the thing. And again, they're using O-rings for the, all the flops and flops that they have on the camera, et cetera, et cetera. So two command dials. I think that's where we need to concentrate on. Yeah, because it does very much kind of, when you pick it up, it does feel like a familiar Nikon camera. Yeah. The F4s and the F80s, F90s, those earlier bodies, not 80, 801. No, 80, 80 came out. Yeah, you're right. It already has a, the it does. command dial. 801, which yes. had that old old school kind of style. Um, the the F5 very much kind of marked that, like, okay, this is the design that we're going with now. Mm. And it's still still continued. Quite a lot of you I've seen have mentioned that you've either used or you have. Baxter's got two F5s. Mm, nice. uh, not too shabby. Um, and a few of you have used uh, the, the F5. If not that you don't have it anymore, that's fair enough. But um, it's, it's definitely got that yeah. Nikon feel about it. It's one thing that I like. Absolutely. And while they still use the same design, mm. especially, I think, you know, kind of stood the test of time. Because if you look at something like F4, yeah. in my opinion, it, it has very kind of 80s design. It does have an yeah. 80s feel to it, for sure. The F5 definitely felt a bit more modern. Jason bought his F5 from us. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, and said it is a beautiful camera. <laughs> it, it is. And the F4 was definitely of an era. Yes. Which is kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of, you can see that, it wasn't made. <laughs> yeah, imagine Walkman and <laughs> a cassette player, you know. So, yeah, exactly. Similar kind of era. It's and a I, boxy design, isn't it? But um, Gijaro made was on the design team for a number of, yes. of Nikon F models, wasn't it? Was it was it the F3 that was the first one? I think he it did? started with EM, actually. EM. It was his first camera. For some of you who watched the interview with Michael Leftriadis, we have a note about that there. Ah. So, but literally, I think his last camera that he designed for Nikon was DA10. Wow, gosh. And uh, so it has that kind of uh, design designer feel yeah. about it. Um, another thing that the F5 has that some of the smaller bodies, because the F100 came out after this one, didn't it? Yes. And it was kind of like the little brother camera. Yes. Uh, and I think the F100 is a simplified, dumbed down, if you like, but not in a bad way. Well, I would say if we have a list of advantages of this camera, a list of disadvantages, one of the disadvantages is heavy. It's size. And for me, second disadvantage, well, F100 is there and it does about 90% of the, what this camera does. Sure. So for a lot of people, 
F100 would be a natural choice yeah. uh, compared to F5. But if you want what people consider to be the ultimate Nikon film camera, F5 is the one. Yes, exactly. Um, Epic Dream said the F5 is the greatest Nikon camera. Bought mine in 99 for sports photography, a marvel of photography. Um, <laughs> Peter said to celebrate the F5 once you finish the, the vlog or the stream I'll take it to the woods along with the 105 macro and shoot <laughs> and shoot a fern <laughs> that's like the typical with some black and white film I hope um, <laughs> and Anthony says sitting here with my own F5 that I bought from Vic Alden's at London Bridge back in the day nice very very cool I'm so glad that so many people who are watching also have the F5 which is great. Yeah, you're right, Dennis. I mean, you've put a dollar's price, understandably, because where you are. When we get them, not the limited edition 50th anniversary ones, but when we get them actually normal edition, they they don't retail for much more than about 500 pounds yeah. if they're in nice nice condition. So you can find them cheaper. Obviously, this one's a little bit special. but um, Yeah, there were only 3,000 produced. Yeah, exactly. And uh, 2,000 of those were supposed to be for Japan. So anyway, we didn't get that many. And we have two of them. And we have two. I don't know nice um but there are also plenty of f100 advocates one thing that i would say is that the f100 with its we've talked about the sticky back problem yes before the f5 i've never seen one that's had no. that issue well the rubber at the back looks pretty much the same yeah i've never seen them with the sticky back no and i wonder why i guess it was just a batch or I guess that's the reason you pay $3,000 for this one and not F100. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Roy points out that the F5 had the last removable pentaprism. That's true. Um, so it had a few options on the pentaprisms. You could get... Uh, I had it saved yeah. here, actually. And that's the reason why people consider it to be the ultimate Nikon film camera, not F6, let's say. Yeah, so you got, uh, obviously, D30. Mm -hmm. No, let's start with the built-in one. Yeah. So what's the built-in one? It's a DP30. Uh, DP30, which is yeah. the standard one. And then the DA30 was the action finder. Yes. So DP30 is the only one that supports actually all metrings, including 3D matrix metering. And uh. 3D matrix metering was the first of its kind for Nikon camera. Yeah. So and 3D matrix metering effectively not just measure the, let's say, the contrast and the brightness of this ob object. It's also will measure the RGB channels. So <laughs> it will me measure it by color. Fancy. So that is available in a built-in um, prism. Now, DA30 was an action finder and effectively it would be used um, somewhere where you wouldn't be able to put your eye next to the viewfinder, right. um, next to the IP. So if actually think about, let's say, um, underwater housing mm. or if the camera attached to somewhere where you can't get close to so like in space exactly <laughs> so come to that um for that reason it's quite rare mm -hmm. and it also was the most expensive one i think it was about 950 or 970 dollars when it first came good out. gracious um they did also do a high magnification finder didn't they yeah dw31 that's basically for macro photography yep. some medical applications fair enough and then we had our waist level exactly now keep in mind that with the dw31 you only have spot metering ah okay so. didn't realize that actually and then with the waist level finder for those who are not sort of regular film photographers that basically means you can look down at your camera and uh, compose and focus by looking down instead of having to hold your camera up to the viewfinder i quite like that yeah. method of shooting Think Hasselblad effectively yeah and i i kind of miss having that on my fm3a mm. i'd love it if it had interchangeable heads it doesn't i don't want to buy an f3 <laughs> But an F3 would be the way around it. Um, but it, I, I quite enjoy the concept of shooting from the hip and doing sort of street photography. pretty cool. And it I was is. actually looking at the data back. So they did MF28 data back. On this yeah, one, that's right. Which actually would record, let's say, date and time. And you can choose the way you could be, you know, day, month, year, and month, day, year, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that they could do is actually um, enter the aperture and shot speed details between the frames. Did it also include the lens data? Because the F6 has the lens data as well. This I'm not 100% sure, Focal potentially, lens. but uh, definitely the shot speed and aperture. Mm. There's one thing that I loved about the F6 was the fact that you didn't need a special back to imprint the information between the frames. Mm -hmm. You could just turn it on as an option. I have it turned on in mine. So you can have focal length, uh, max uh, aperture and shutter speed and ISO mm. all in between each frame. I think it's super cool. Um, That's nice, isn't it? I think I need a data back for my FM3A anyway. Anyway, to give us a thumbs up, thank you for everyone who has freshly joined us. We've got quite a lot of people watching, but 
feel free to give us a little. Yeah, how many like. do we have so far? We have 168, and we've only got 53 likes. So, oh. <gasps> shocking. You know what happens when you give a thumbs up to us? Mm -hmm. Then Google knows the video is good, so I better promote it too people who just wandering on the YouTube. That's right. So the more thumbs up, the more people will watch us effectively. Yeah, absolutely. Was now Nick can asked an interesting question. Can you get the bulk film back? Was there a bulk film back for the F5? I don't remember seeing one at mm, any point. No, me neither. A bulk film back. I know that there obviously were several um additional yeah. accessories. The F3 I thought was the last one that had a bulk loader. Yeah, which back. one had the 750? I know there's 250 back, it's and I think there was a 750 back as well, wasn't F2. it? F2. I think the, the F2. Okay. Yeah, because we've got one downstairs. And when we get to that, we'll definitely show it. We'll okay. show it off. You'll need to, like, go, <laughs> it's so big. Just big and heavy. strong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but that's what I've got you for. Someone put in our video on the 2470 video. Yeah. Saying, oh, it's funny you go with the little cameras. I care with me, you know. <laughs> This and this is 3.5 kilos, <laughs> like, and I want to replay. You gotta find me with my five by four setup. That's you know? right, exactly. That was a truck right behind. Another it all, another you know? video yeah. with your with your donkey <laughs> or your camel. Um, well, is growing, so yeah. yeah. Or oh, John Hughes, yeah. John's wife, John's wife also wife. could carry stuff for us. Um, Baxter says, I think the F4 had a bulk bag. Okay, interesting. I'm gonna have a look into that. Um, Ed says, I would love the F3. I do love the F3. I just, I love my little FM3A, but mm. the F3 does tempt me because of all the accessories and stuff like that. But anyway, that's for a future live stream. That's true. Um, few people are mentioning that the uh, that they had different cameras that had sticky backs. I haven't yet seen anyone that said I had an F5 with a sticky back. Um, yeah, F90 is notorious. The easiest way to get rid of it is actually just get a sandpaper and just scrub that rubber layer off the back. Oh my God. But then that's a lot of dust anyway. Mm. That's not a nice way to, to do it. But yeah, it's nice not to have a sticky bag. Um, let's talk about other features. Okay, well, just look, I mean, they, they had a special shutter which was tested for 150,000 cycles. Which is a lot. Exactly. In those days. First of its kind. And mm -hmm. it's also what they call self-diagnostic yeah. and self-adjusting shutter. Yeah. So it's effectively will check. There's a sensor there which checks the shot every time it fires. Mm. And if there's anything wrong with it, it will give you ERR message. Which is an interesting di and slightly difficult thing maybe to diagnose. But mm -hmm. I suppose, what did that mean? You just wouldn't waste a, uh, a shot if it was wrong. Well, it, it meant that you weren't wasting shots on... It's a weird one because they mentioned as well like uh, trying to, you know, kind of prevent blur. And mm. I'm not sure when they said prevent blur, if they refer to just overall vibration uh, sure. within the camera or it just means that they had basically AFS uh, focus priority function built in. Sure, which would also be useful um, mm. because definitely in, in those days you wouldn't want an autofocus camera that then takes shots unless yeah. you decide for it to, that would then be out of focus. That's true. And then because camera shot eight frames per second as well, mm -hmm. so you needed a shutter that would allow for that, first of all. Yeah. But also, yes, because it was created a lot of vibration, they have this thing which they called, what do they call? They call it mirror balancer. Yes. It's effectively this mechanism which would allow the um, for the mirror go up and down eight times without creating too much vibrations effectively. It's very clever. And in fact, I'm just going to share my screen here so that you can see it. But that's basically what it looks like, um, this mirror balancer mechanism. For anyone that's feeling particularly geeky, um, you can go and have a look at the Nikon F5 history page. Um, and, it, and it shows you how it works and what it does. But I mean, super technical for... It's day and age, yeah. I would say. And um, and 150,000 shots is kind of average now. Even the smallest bodies have that. But that's the, that's the thing. If we think about it, for, let's say, if we look at all those specs from today's perspective, it mm. all sounds not very exciting. Mm. But at the time, those features were kind of the first of their kind, really. Yeah, and the autofocus um, was also particularly good <laughs> yeah, they did five points three of them were cross type yeah so you know cross type and linear points that, yeah uh, we always talk about digital cameras yeah and, so, we, and we're completely spoiled now yeah. completely spoiled but at that time did they have afc on the f4 they did right they did it just wasn't as good the really? way the way the algorithm work was yeah. completely different than it was on f5 right so f5 definitely created 
probably, I, I would, I, if I would say, well, I would call a four as the first generation of Swox. Of course, we have a three AF, but I'm not touching that because for me, it's more of a prototype camera, effectively. So yeah, it was released to the public, but it wasn't used as broadly, let's say, as a four. Yeah. So if you think about a four as a kind of first generation of what's Focus, F five has improved quite a bit on that. Yeah, considerably, and so it had this what we now take for granted having dynamic AF, yeah. um, but was the first of its kind to have dynamic AF. So for moving subjects it would actually track the subject, which mm -hmm. was like mind-blowing, amazing. <laughs> wow. And having five points. Five whole points. Five whole points. Now we have, what, 450. <laughs> and that's just the ones that they decided to show. That's but right. There are actually thousands of them there. So Nikon F4 only had one. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, exactly. Um, Avna would prefer to win a Nikon F5, but that's fine. I understand. That's not what we're giving away today, I'm afraid. Yeah, if you have a million subscribers, we may give one away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when we get to that point, you so know. It's scalable. It is. It is. Ask um, your friends to subscribe. You know, let's keep going. Yeah. And uh, Epic Dream was saying, remember the F5 commercial that was shot on yes, the F5? I have a link on that. So if you, you want to share that, we can have a look I don't. Together. Will we be able to, let's see. Will we be able to share this link? It's the first one, actually. If oh. Just press enter, and then it will turn into <laughs> double click. <laughs> I feel like such a, a dork. Okay, one moment. This is a video within a video. How is this going to work? Let's find out. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to switch my screen over. My computer's going to explode. It's not, but anyway, let's see if it will let. Wow. Wow. And there you have it, folks. We managed to um, actually share that. I don't know. Yeah, it looked like it was shot by Brothers Lumiere. <laughs> you know, after <laughs> the coming train, the steam train. That's the second <laughs> commercial they did. Sorry. Oh, let's talk about Nikon. Yeah. <laughs> you can check that video out afterwards. I forgot that it had an oh, no. autoplay. Nikon. Nikon. Nikon, like the, the Japanese. Um, anyway, I thought that that was really cool. It's pretty cool. And I have seen it a few times. I remember uh, Tony showing it to me back in the day. But yeah, Ed says the F5 imported from the future. It was one of their taglines yeah. that they used. Uh, the speed. Yeah, for the camera. In fact, it was also used by NASA uh, in space. They modified it slightly and they had all these kind of wonderful, the, yeah. the back. What did they do? Put, put some space into it? They put some, some yeah. stars and galaxies. No, I'm going to show some you. Asteroids. They modified it to look like this. Mm -hmm. It was modified with, it was a an MF28, but I believe that it was custom designed for NASA. I don't think it was a standard MF-28. Mm. They also had this kind of like interesting checklist of their settings. There is um, a website uh, run by Tim M. Chapman, uh, dot com, who has a little um, link there called NASA Nikon F5. And it actually has the list of all the settings that they use. So they used a 50 mil lens. They used ISO 800 CNEG. Mm. Um, they had to make sure that the battery icon was full, obviously. Don't go into... Charge your batteries. Charge your batteries, people. <laughs> Take fresh batteries <laughs> don't, don't with you. Don't go space without batteries. Mm -mm. Don't forget your film. Um, but they were using uh, matrix metering. They were using continuous high-speed mode. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the tricky thing was, because they had taken uh, F3s into space. Yes, and we had actually one in the show. That's right. Yeah, yeah but the problem was that it was very difficult for an astronaut to focus. Yeah, they even had those spikes on the lenses, so you would poof, put your thick gloves, you know, kind of through mm. that to focus. But again, because you're wearing a helmet, yeah. then it's really difficult to see what's in the viewfinder. Yeah, you don't, you just cannot. Um, so the F5, with its autofocus capability, was the camera of choice after that for NASA for a while. So. That's true. And then if you have an alien on a spaceship, you need autofocus, isn't it, to capture And you need those eight frames per second. Exactly. In space, <laughs> no one can hear you scream. <laughs> 
anyway, so I thought that that was um, a part of its sort of iconic history that was wor definitely worth sharing. There was something else that someone mentioned. Oh, yeah, the fact that the housing was used by the Kodak Eastman company. That's right. There were several versions of Kodak camera. Mm. It was... Uh, one was like $25,000, another one was $30,000. <laughs> Only. Only, yeah. Bargain. So, you know. Yeah, so the body was so durable um, and so well tested that um, Kodak had decided to put their their sort of digital camera into the F5 but housing. Let me tell you. So Kodak DCS 600 series was launched in 1999, consisted of two megapixel back, and it was $30,000 at the time. And then, yeah, we had 700 series DS DCS 700 in 2001. Mm -hmm. And that was surprisingly, uh, it was a smaller sensor, but eight, it uh, costed $8,000. Oh, well, it's very reasonable. Here you go. <laughs> I'll buy two. Um, exactly. Uh, who was it? Peter was asking what watch you're wearing, just out uh, by the by. Uh, to the Black Bay 58. Yeah, okay. Not sponsored yet, by the way. Oh, fun. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Roy says he loved the F5 so much that he never bought an F6. Um, and uh, Chili McFly1 says Nikon F5 manual, if you have it, is almost as valuable as the camera. Mm. Yeah, the instruction manuals are quite hard to get hold of. We might have a dog-eared one downstairs yeah. somewhere. Or if you're looking for the data back, that would cost you pretty much as much as the cost of actual camera. Yeah, easily, easily. Um, who else used Nikon bodies? It, uh, Fuji did, didn't they? They used the D200. Yeah, they used D200 for their S5 series. Yeah. They would change the sensor, but use the same body. Interesting. And um, there's been a few, I've noticed a few people say, oh, my eyepiece for my Fuji is exactly the same as the Nikon one and things like that. Well, but that was later cameras. Yeah, X-Pro one, mm. and I think could be two as well, I'm not sure, um, uses FM eyepiece. It's interesting, isn't yeah. it? Like you get these little crossovers, which every, normally doesn't yeah, happen. Every now and then we have someone pop in um, to the shop and say, can I have, let's say, minus one or minus two eyepiece for my X-Pro camera? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Joey says, howdy from Texas, just got my ZFC yesterday and I love it. Well, nice. lucky you, Joey. Um, very, very nice indeed. I hope you enjoy using that. Um, Anthony said, uh, rear, rear shutter curtain sync with the flash was a great feature all those years ago. I didn't actually realize that that was a feature in the F5. But rear sync? Yeah. Well, my F100 had rear sync, so... I, yeah, but I thought that it was a later... I didn't realize that the F5 had mm. it, but that's great. And it also does work with um, with the creative lighting system, although you have to adapt it in many yeah. different ways to get it to work. The funny thing that the sync speed on this camera is actually not 250s of a second, but 100, uh, 300s of a second. So it can sync to 300s of a second. Wow. But with many flashes, not at full power. And obviously 250s work as it should. As it should. Interesting. Didn't realize that. And it also has support for vibration reduction. So... If you put a VR lens on it, mm. it will work on this camera. Ah, so the one of the beauties of the F5 is that it will obviously work with AI and AIS lenses, although you'll only get spot or average metering. Um, it will also work with all of the AF D type and G type lenses. It won't work with E type lenses, so electromagnetic diaphragm mm. or AFP style lenses, mm. understandably. I mean, even the F6 doesn't work with those. Uh, when the camera was readily available, you could actually get it modified to take pre-AI lenses as oh, well. You could get that, that front little plastic aperture indexing lever thing there. You could get it modified. So would it, like they would modify it so that it would fall? The or? metal one. Oh, right. Like, okay. you, like you have on the F3 and the F4. That's good to know. Um, obviously, Nikon figured that enough pros were probably not using pre-AI glass at that point. And um, there were so many AF lenses available by the time the F5 came out mm. that they were like, it's not going to be a standard feature, but if you need it, you can get it. You could send your camera off to get that done. Um, so that was also a possibility. It's one thing that I kind of miss on the, I wish that the F6 being the final manual camera, I kind of mm. wish that it had that metal uh, removable, movable coupling lever. So if actually it would take all the lenses. Everything. That yeah. just would have been perfect. Obviously not the, the current E-type lenses, but mm -hmm. that's not such an issue. Um, 
Anthony also says that Anthony is our spokesperson for the F5 because he's obviously got one and is using one. <laughs> says uh, custom settings and displays on the real rear LCD screen. Yeah, so this was the first camera that had that little back LCD. That's true. Which we kind of pointed out in our podcast last week that the Z9 doesn't look like it's got one of those, does it? No. Which is interesting. But the, all the other flagship bodies took from that. So you'd get your sort of small extra settings on the back there. Um, and you had this little flip down uh, panel to access your ISO, your bracketing, yeah. your... And you have 24 custom settings features. Yeah. Um, although, good gracious, 24 custom settings. What are you going to ask for? <laughs> and then those 24 settings would have A and B banks. So yeah. if you're sharing your camera so between two people, like me and you would share the camera, you couldn't assign your settings to bank A and I would assign my settings to bank B. That's so clever. Maybe we should do that with the Zs, with U1 and U2, so we don't keep changing each well, other. Well, actually, <laughs> personally, I prefer U1 and U2 over, let's say, shooting banks on something like D850. Yeah, me too. Uh, because there, it's literally just one movement. You yeah. Go, let's say from let's say AF, AFS mode for portrait use, let's say an aperture priority, go to U2, and here you've got Chaspi priority and AFC. Yeah, and it definitely is, it's a bit more sensible because you can also program in your like manual yeah. aperture priority, shutter priority program. You can put in your white balance, your, yeah. your picture control, whatever you want. Well, one day we'll do a whole stream on that. I don't know if it'll cover a whole stream. It might do. <laughs> we'll, we'll do a series of whole stream. It's going to be a whole month of custom setting. <laughs> God. I know I did do one back in lockdown. Can you imagine how much entertainment is going to be? Uh, it would be really exciting. Maybe you can do that one when I'm next away. Nah. <laughs> I'll do the copyright. That's even better. The copyright for copyright photographers. photographers. Yes. Definitely doing that one when I'm yeah. away. Thank you very Before much. Before we all do that, I will give um, uh, what's called a release form to everyone <laughs> to sign it before they can see it. <laughs> yeah. And only after everyone's signed, then we can continue, really. So, I mean, yeah. that's with it. That's kind of part of the whole thing, isn't Absolutely. it? You've got to do that. Um, Jan said, great scene with the, oh, D5 or F5 in the film Vertical Limit. Haven't seen that film. Didn't know that. There were a few people mentioning that the F5 had been used by uh, Julia Roberts in mm. Stepmom and Jurassic Park Lost World. Didn't realize that either. I have seen them on mm -hmm. a few film sets and stuff. And at one point, I think they were even used in one of the old, like, not not CSI, but maybe NCIS or something. I see lots of Nikons on all those crime shows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And sometimes with the, um, sometimes with the old ring flashes, sometimes with the yeah. R1C1, depending on what they're doing. It's very cool. Um, Roy said the Z9 should be called the Z1. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the Z6 or Z7 was used on that. Do you know, uh, have you seen Mayor of Town? I haven't seen it, but... Great I, show, so yeah. yeah, she's using it there. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Wow. They're to photograph some corpses, obviously. Of course. Know. Lovely. Um, Peter asked, do we stock AI conversion kits? We don't, sadly. Um, I think that the last of the AI conversion kits had been bought out many, many years ago. Yeah, that was before us even, I think, no? Yeah. Because we've been here for a while. A while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. Um, I did managed to find Nikon actually had a couple lurking around in their Nikon spares department, but they were for really obscure lenses. Um, but I think if you, if you delve deep enough, there are a few people around who actually do the conversions. You can send your lenses off to, um, someone in the US that I've now forgotten the name of mm -hmm. who will do the conversion. Sendine will also do it in the UK, although they're quite expensive, but they will mm -hmm. offer that service. So if you ever need it done, they'll just file down the bits that need filing down. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, and it was an F5. Okay, good, thank you. And it was CSI that they used the F5. And they used the F5 to film The Matrix. Wow, for the slow-mo shot. Interesting. That is oh, interesting oh, because it was so yeah. fast. That's cool, Baxter. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that. Um, David, the F5 and the, F and the D3 are not the same body. They, the D3 is actually physically larger. It's got more going on inside it. This is a slimmer camera if you look at the profile but it is very similar in its sort of overall layout i would say yeah. but it's not the exact same chassis at all um and obviously the d3 has a massive screen on the back mm -hmm. but but it's it's a thicker camera isn't it yeah and it is very heavy yeah exactly i think one thing i don't like about this camera is the lock for the on and off switch mm. and they kind of removed it for other cameras i don't think they have it on f6 do they no the they don't thank goodness because i don't like it because it's actually it's difficult to operate with one finger. Yeah. So on something like F6, you can just 
turn it on yeah. and start to shoot. This one, it's a little bit more... Yeah, it's yeah. a two-finger operation. Yeah, basically. exactly. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Michael, all of the... Uh, although we mentioned the lenses, so all the AF lenses, not AFP, uh, the D, the G, not the E, those work on the F5. So, so anything... So no the P's and no, no the E's. No P's and E's. Exactly. But all the others do. Um, and they autofocus and work. And as Con said, they VR, the VR works as well. Um, flashes also do work on the F5. Um, I've, the only one I haven't really looked into is the SB5000, actually. Because, I mean, you wouldn't get the radio trigger capability but you don't get that with a lot of dslrs no. but you could probably put it on and it would still work because it has the exact same hot shoe as the digital bodies yeah. um so and have some version of ttl support there yeah and even if you're looking at like remote releases and stuff like that the remotes for the d800 d3 d4 series they all take that 10 pin socket mm -hmm. it's the same on the F5, yeah, and then you it's on the back. Flash sync for the studio lights if you don't want to use radio triggers. Yeah, exactly. And if you want a sort of infrared release, you've got the ML3. Um, you know, I'd be interested to yeah, know if the old the ML L3. Yeah, not that. Old, confused yet. <laughs> it is very confusing. Yeah. Um, the the infrared one that actually then plugs into the ten pin socket on the on the back there. Um, what I would wonder is if the WR11, WRR11A, which is a 10 pin, if that works with it. I don't think it will. I think it's just oh, too modern, but we can try it. I don't think it will fry the camera if you try it. No. <laughs> fry the camera and then set up. Well, maybe I'll try it with my F6 and then we can go one. If it works with the F6, yeah, then it. Don't might. try it at home. No, exactly, unless you really feel like it. But yeah, you're right, Chili McFly, after eight batteries. It is very heavy. Um, yeah, you could use uh, one of those um, uh, MH battery units. It's called uh, MN30. The problem is it's difficult to get one in a good shape nowadays. They were notorious for losing their charge very quickly, and with the time passed, uh, they wouldn't keep their charge for more than, let's say, 30 minutes or something like this. So, yeah, nowadays, yeah. double A's are the only option, pretty we, much. Yeah, we did actually have... Um, there was someone who had sold us some brand new unopened MN30s and even brand new unopened, they didn't hold their charge. They lasted, you'd fully charge them overnight and they'd last about 10 minutes. So we um, managed to find someone who would, what's the word, like resell them, you mm -hmm. know, like actually replenish the battery. Oh, I see. Okay. But it was so expensive mm -hmm. and it took them months. So it wasn't really, for us in the long, the grander scheme of things, it wasn't worth it. But if you can find MN30s out there, then you may be able to get them restored and replenished because um, it's definitely cheaper than running AA batteries. Yeah, but then if you get rechargeables, this is true. You should be fine. Yeah, well, I wonder because sometimes rechargeables don't allow you to use the full uh, like eight frames per second. Yeah, example. so th that's only available with MN30. Ah. Yeah, so that's not really available with double A's. Interesting. Yeah. Didn't know that. There you go. Um, Roy, I'm pretty sure, does that not look like it has all the pins in the hot shoe to you? Because I'm pretty sure that that's a modern hot shoe. Yeah. It's got all looks four of them. The hot shoe, yeah. It doesn't look like it's missing any pins, Roy. So I thought that that would be compatible with all the current all ones. All right. Quick uh, clarification. So it's eight frames per second when used with the MM30 mm. in AFC mode at shutter speed of 250s okay. or faster. Okay. So no, not at 125th, let's say. Mm, interesting. Um, and in terms of the, uh, we talked about the metering system, didn't we? Yeah, so it's a three, three matrix metering, which is the first of its kind. Yeah. So we've done this. Um, it's got auto rewind as well. It's four, frame, uh, four seconds. That's right. Four so seconds. Rewind the whole uh, 36 uh, frames film. Yeah. And actually, when you put the film in, it loads pretty quickly as fancy. well. It's very fancy. You could, if you wanted to save battery life, you could manually wind back in the film. Like hand crank it, Who does it if nowadays? you want to. Maybe I don't know. Maybe someone quite likes the idea of doing that. I would. And someone who loves manual labor. Like, yeah, but it's it does save a little bit of battery yeah, life if true. you're in the field. So you could do it that way. Um, but uh, it, yeah. there was a slightly confusing article where they said that it had a manual advance. It's not a manual advance. No, it's, it's a, a manual rewind. Absolutely. Isn't it? So you can't really. It doesn't have any crank to, you know, advance your film. No, exactly. Um, now, there were a couple of articles that I found that were quite interesting, one of which was, I'm going to find it, the awards that it was given. So 
So it came out in 96. Mm -hmm. In 1997... Amateur photographer, camera of the year. The British institution. Yeah, that is AP. Um, the camera of the year, 1997, and 35mm SLR and medium format camera of the year mm. was awarded. Even beat medium format cameras. Yeah, it did in, in 97. It also won the Camera Grand Prix in Japan, mm. which was previously won by, I mean, a lot of cameras, but Nikon, do you remember they did their Gold FA? Oh, right. That was as a... Uh, I know it's your favorite camera. That's why yes. I bring it up. Um, <laughs> so, I'll, I'll need a golden Rolex for that. <laughs> and a golden Bentley. Why not? A chain. <laughs> a butler. Um, and, they, and it also won in August 97, the ISA, European Imaging and Sound Association, European mm -hmm. Camera of the Year for 97-98. And TIPA, the Technical Image Press Association, Best SLR. TIPA. Yeah. <laughs> for 97-98. So it won loads and loads of awards. Um, I found this rather lovely blog, which I will, it's got lots of ads on it, but I'm going to share it anyway, because I think um, that it's worth sharing. So this uh, chat, the blog is called 35 MMC. Um, and this is by Vladislav Stanimirovich. And he wrote this great article on the F5. Part of what was great about it was the fact that he was, it was kind of a camera that he'd been lusting after. Mm -hmm. um, but also the fact that he shares these lovely sample images from the camera. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's just, it's well worth having a look. If you get a chance to, um, then please do have a look at the 35 MMC article on the Nikon 5. It's called F5, A Dream Come True. And it's, it's just very, it's a very pleasant read, mm. I would say. And it's got some nice sample images in there. And it was actually, he reviewed it only, I think, in... October last year. Mm. So it's quite a modern review, a modern take on an old film Yeah, camera. I think we have a bit of a resurgence of film. And uh, yeah, you've got uh, blogs like 35MMC and emulsive.org as well. Yeah. Where a lot of people coming back to film. And we start to see that those cameras that were cheaper than, let's say, last year, they are starting to slowly increase in price again. That's right. And also... Um, the uh, photography show, which we have over here in the UK in Birmingham, which is at the in the NEC. Yeah, it's in the month, isn't it? In it's September. 17th? Uh, like around the 18th, yeah. yeah. Um, they're actually going to do a whole analog sort of spotlight, if you like, mm -hmm. um, on gear, on uh, film, on inspiration. Yeah. I wonder if you thought they'll be there because they're UK manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would be really cool if they were. Yeah, absolutely. Although I know that, I mean, I don't know about Ilford, but I know there's a lot of film uh, companies that are struggling to source and supply. So mm. I don't know. But it would be it would be very cool if they yeah, were. Probably Analog Wonderland will be there. Maybe I will ask them, actually. Yeah. Who knows? Cosmo Photo, they're London based, so yeah, there might be there. a few. They might be um, checking in. But it was definitely interesting to see that a show that is primarily based around photo, sort of digital imaging and video has now opened up a kind of analog section as well. It's cool, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe Nikon will release F7 at some point. <laughs> you know? We can dream. Oh, yeah, well, if we keep going at it. I not? doubt it. Adrian says rechargeable AA batteries are usually lower voltage. Yeah. So I wonder if you can't get as high frames per second with that. That's yeah. often And the way. you always need to have a look at the brands because some brands of the batteries may not work as well. So just try them out and stick to what works. Yeah, exactly. Jeremy's going to come and watch us back later. He said mm. it was nice to see the team restored to two. <laughs> yes, uh, the the dynamic Giro. Um, Drazen, you're quite right. So you've got the EXIF data that you could put between frames if mm. you wanted to. With the MF28. The yeah. MF28. You also had this very snazzy Nikon photo secretary. Oh, yes. Piece of software. It's, uh... <laughs> it's like, I love the name. Yeah. It exactly. is very 50s. Not, yeah. For a yeah. camera that came came out in the 90s, it's like, oh, photo secretary. secretary. Um, so the photo secretary was essentially a bit of software that would allow you to download the EXIF information from the camera, wouldn't it, when you were shooting? That's true. I mean, it would allow you as well to control the camera a little bit. I and didn't The control know that. settings were available as well, so you would need to have a Windows 95 <laughs> installed on your computer. <laughs> Not much use yeah. now. And then you could use either MC33 or MC34. I think MC34 would come with 
two floppy disks <laughs> with it. Um, so good fun, good Amazing. fun. And that was before MV1, which was released for cameras like F6 and uh, F100. Yeah. Uh, and that would use a photo secretary version too. Ah. And then Paul points out then you had the Meta 35. Yeah. Well, that's a current version of that because yeah. MV1 are very difficult to source. That's nowadays. right. Well, unfortunately, the Meta 35 is also discontinued now, but well, it. You've got was... one next to your desk, right? Shh. No, no. Shh. <laughs> I have one we personally, may have a video coming out. Uh, but uh, we don't have any for sale, sadly. But yes, I have one of the very coveted Meta 35s, which they very kindly sent me quite a few years ago now. Yeah. Have you um, tried it? With the F6. Yeah. Yes, I have. But have my, I will. Anyway, I'll report back when I have some better findings on that. But it was great. I have seen them around lurking on places like eBay. Um, but I think it was better suited to more modern applications than the MV1 or the Nikon Photo Secretary. That's true. I've seen MV1 on eBay listed at £300. Um, £300. Yeah. Crikey. Wow. So basically about the same as camera, let's say, in well-used condition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Peter was going to put a link to something, but there's a colon with no link. He said another great 35mmc read on the F5 is this one. There is no article, but I'm sure you'll link it for us. Because, mm. yes, I think if you're interested in the F5, those blogs and articles are still very relevant now. Yeah. And a lot of those are written more recently. So you can look at the older tech spec articles and the reviews that came out at the time. Simon did a review when it came out. You know, Simon Stafford. Yeah. Ken Rockwell did a review when it came out. You see, nowadays we choose inconvenience at our own <laughs> deal. You know, we choose to shoot film. That's right. Not because we have to and we only have film to shoot with. Yeah. Because obviously digital is so much easier, you know, but we choose that. We yeah. To go through all the hoops wait for the film to be developed to mm -hmm. find that there's a flare on it or nothing being developed. You know, you never know. Yeah. But that excitement, I think, is quite important. I think so too. And I also think that it's a much more emotional thing than it used to be. Shooting film for a professional event like the Olympics or a World Cup or anything like that maybe wasn't as much of an experience as it would be now if you went there and you were like, yeah. I'm just going to shoot on film because I want to. Exactly. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? It's my choice. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Michael George would like to hear me sing opera. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Much appreciated. Um, now, yes, there are a few other mentions of EXIF. The F19, F90X had shooting memory EXIF also. Didn't know that. And you mm -hmm. can apparently also use the F90X with the Meta 35. Um, yeah, Meta 35s are very difficult to source. Apparently, I wonder if someone will, maybe it's a Kickstarter. Con, do you feel like? <laughs> yeah, raise some money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe we could do something. But yeah, there's definitely, don't do that. What did you do? <laughs> Please all say no. It yes. won't be this week. Yes, where do I vote? I'll have to Explain prepare. Me how to vote. Now me. prepare. <laughs> I hate you. I'll prepare my piece. It won't be opera, whatever it is. Um, I'm sorry, the choice has been made. <laughs> <laughs> Who said no? Let's find them. No, no one said no yet. That's very scary. Um, I, Terry said, uh, Terry who at the beginning of this stream, I noticed before we went live, said, what an opportune stream. I'm thinking of adding an F5 to my collection. The problem is that when I talk about film cameras, I start to think, maybe I should have one of those in my collection. Mm. Um, it says, I shoot film and work in the dark room. So yeah, easy is not my thing. Exactly. And I like that. Who's the Maria Callas? Who's Maria Callas? Oh, well, there you go. Wow. I mean, that's a compliment and a half. You haven't even heard me sing yet, but thank you. Um, right. So, mm. have we covered all the tech specs before we move on to other things? I'm not going to sing live on the stream. Before you start to sing? I'm definitely not singing. Not this week. <laughs> uh, good, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, well, let's do our competition winners, shall we? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I can see where the voting is going for this blimmin. <laughs> Michael. Who, who that? Wow. All right. You didn't mention Justin Bieber, so I don't so know you who don't you're know talking anything. about. Exactly. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Right, I'm going to just do the wheel of names here for you all. Thank you for that. Yeah, one day I'll sing for you. Maybe not today, but uh, another day. <laughs> So we're going to do the live one, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to do the live one first. Bear with me. Uh, she says. Is that the live one? Oh, I was getting there. Let me just try that. This is Notebook Live. I'm going to refresh the page and see if it wants to cooperate. Uh, th that's that's not, not the, the live, live one. Definitely okay, not. maybe I'll try the comments one. That looks... Okay, we'll do the comments one from last week first. Uh, let me just switch over so you can see it. All right. Uh, so this is for the comments from last week's video. I'm dancing. There's no music. But anyway. And it is for uh, Per, per Schulholm. Yay! Okay, good. Well done. Very well done, Per. So uh, that's for you. Uh, you're going to have to send us an email to media at grayswestminster.co.uk and then we'll get your prize sent out to you. Very well done yeah. for that. Tell us small, medium or large. <laughs> no, it's a notebook, you silly Billy. <laughs> okay, and then next up, let's see if the live one... Will... There we go. That looks a bit more like it. Yeah. The live one is always uh, very, very busy. All right, here we go. The competition... You know, it's tough on this one. It is you know. tough. Okay. Do, 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 do. <gasps> Yay! Yeah. Landed on Roy. Well done, Roy. Well done, Roy. So, yeah, yeah. Drop, drop us an email, same email address, media at graceswestminster.co.uk, Roy, and we will get your notebook sent out to you. I can feel the postage is going to be expensive. It is, because he's is in it, Australia. Is, is it to Perth? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely to somewhere in Oz, yeah. so there you go. Um, do we sell the K3 focusing screen for the DF? Sadly not, because Nikon never made official focusing screens for uh, the DF, yeah. sadly. Uh, Randall voted no, thanks. <laughs> Just for me. He doesn't know that I can sing. That's fine. I don't mind. I was like, no pressure on me that way. Well, I can tell you, you're not good at making Russian salad. I'm not good at making Russian salad. But for sure. very good potato salad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If we don't put the word Russian in it, then it was no. fine. Um, was there anything else? I would keep the uh, F5 over the NC2000. What's the NC2000? Did I miss oh. something there? Uh, but long live film, anyway. There we go. I quite agree. Um, I'm sure that I can sing something. A bit of Ed Sheeran. <laughs> <laughs> Please Gaga. don't. No. Um, Tristan said, I recently found a roll of film I'd shot on my F5 almost three years ago that had a single photo of my father who recently passed away. It was the only pic of him on the entire roll and it turned out well. I think that that is beautiful. Yeah. I really like that. And that's something that you obviously could still get with digital but normally digital is so kind of almost disposable in the way that we shoot with it whereas finding a roll of film like that is is something quite special so thank you very much tristan for that we are that's a wrap isn't it yeah it's a wrap for so. today it's time, isn't it Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for everyone who has given us a like for all of you who have subscribed, whether recently or in the past. If you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe. We would very much appreciate it. Um, we've got a premiere coming out. Have we premiered it for tomorrow, the video? Not yet. Not yet. No. There will be a premiere. <laughs> it's one video a day this week. Because why not? Yes, because, because we can. Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to have to do some more filming so that we have more content to produce for you in between we will become a full-on production house uh, something like that anyway Grey's Westminster Media Productions Limited um oh thank you Nick can the F501 was called an N2000 oh right okay yes in the United States they have different ones F80 and yes yeah. they put the ends everywhere apparently 72 people want me to sing good gracious right we love you very much we will see you next week uh, for various streams videos and all sorts have a wonderful weekend all thank you very much for watching thank you <laughs>